Hi, good evening. It is time for our weekly Bible study again, and we are starting uh, Isaiah this week. I told some of you last week you'd better pray for me because I don't think I have ever taught Isaiah before, and so uh, we are going to uh, maneuver through this together. I, uh, I, I enjoyed this week's lesson. I uh, but Isaiah scares me. I, there's so much of it I don't understand, and so it, sometimes parts of it kind of scare me, but we will make it through this uh, somehow. So let's pray, and we'll get started. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you use your word to speak to us just as much today as you did thousands of years ago. So, Lord, I pray that you will speak to us through this, this study, and that, Father, we will soak it into our hearts and apply it to our lives and help us to be the people that you call us to be and to have good relationship with you and not to to continue to sin and turn away from you and to miss your warning signs, Father. Lord, I pray for our nation. I pray for us as a people that, Father, you would just uh, deliver us and help us to be your children, obedient and loving and, and humble. So, Father, just Help us with these lessons and guide us where you want us to go, Father. Forgive us of our sins. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, I do want to do a little background on the book of Isaiah before I get started. Um, I, uh, I kind of researched the background a little bit just to have a better understanding of where we were coming from for this study. And Isaiah was... Um, a contemporary or at the same time as like Hosea, Amos, Micah. Um, his ministry started about 740 BC, so about 740 years before Christ was born, and went to uh, probably about 680, 681, somewhere up in there maybe. Um, he, uh, he had his ministry during um, the king, like Uzziah, it, it talks about the year that King Uzziah died. Uh, so a little bit of Uzziah and then his son Jotham and then Ahaz, who was very evil, and then uh, Hezekiah. And that's kind of the era of his, um, his ministry. He was in uh, Judah and Micah was also in Judah where uh, Hosea and um, Amos were, <clears throat> excuse me, in the northern kingdom. And I'm going to review the history with you here just a little bit in just a minute. But um, we know that Isaiah was married probably and had a couple of sons that we know of. Uh, Jewish tradition says that he was killed by uh, during Manasseh's reign, who was another very evil king. Um, but tradition says that he was killed during Manasseh's reign. Uh, it says that he was literally sawed in half. I researched that a little bit, and what sometimes they did is they would like hollow out a log and put them in it and just saw them in half. I can't even imagine. Uh, but anyway, that was uh, just that little tidbit. Um, some scholars, more modern scholars, say that they don't really think that Isaiah wrote all of the book of Isaiah, but when I read some of the argument to for and against, uh, I had a tendency to believe that he probably wrote most of it. Uh, some of the most resounding arguments that he did to me was that, um, like, there's this bridge between, there's like 66 chapters. It's kind of a long book. And um, the first 35 chapters, I think it is, take place during his ministry. And then there's this bridge of 36, 37, 38, 39, which kind of bridges the two sections of the book. And then the last half, 40 through 66, actually um, are a little bit like what John did when he was kind of projected into the future and he wrote Revelation on the Isle of Patmos. Well, it's kind of like that with Isaiah. He was kind of projected into the future. And so he foretells a lot of the things that were going to happen. He foretells primarily about Judah. He deals with uh, Israel some, but primarily about Judah, which was his home kingdom. Um, and so to review the history just a little bit in case you've forgotten, if you remember after Solomon, his son Rehoboam uh, became king after him and the nation and Israel, the entire, the 10 tribe, the 12 tribes, I mean, of Israel actually split into two kingdoms and the northern kingdom was 10 tribes 
and then the southern kingdom was uh, the two tribes of Judah and Benjamin. And the, the central point for the southern kingdom of Judah, which it's just referred to as Judah, was Jerusalem, Jerusalem, where the northern kingdom was like Sechem, Sechem, however you say that, and Samaria up in there. And the northern kingdom kind of went downhill before the southern kingdom as far as going away from God and having uh, really um, ungodly rulers. And, and they both did. But And um, the northern kingdom, of course, was... Uh, was uh, taken over by Assyria, and the southern kingdom of Judah was w went into captivity uh, into Babylon. And so that's just a real recap, I guess, of, of kind of the history, just to kind of set the stage of of uh, of the world that Isaiah lived in. Um, he uh, he was very concerned. He he loved Judah. He loved his his kingdom, and he didn't want it to happen to him, and he was a true prophet. And I think sometimes we, when we think of a prophet, we just think of someone who forecasts the future, and that's not really true. A prophet does foretell things, uh, but they all, they're the mouthpiece of God. They are the, the mediator, if you will, between God and man um, before Jesus came, and and they, they tell the people what God wants them to tell them, and sometimes it's it's miserable for them and it's dangerous for them, um, and and they also tell God what the people want to tell God, as if God doesn't already know. But the the prophet works as kind of that mediator, that go between between God and the people. And so I'm sure there was more that I should have uh, remembered, <laughs> but um, that was uh, that was pretty much the gist of what I read. Isaiah is, he, he gets to business, I mean, quickly in his book. He does not uh, fiddle around about, he goes right to work of telling the people what's going wrong. It, we start in verse 10 tonight in our lesson, but he, in verses 1 through 9, he just dives right in and he basically says, you know, the, the ox knows its master and the donkey knows his owner better than you know God. You've drifted that far away. You have no relationship. You don't even know God anymore. You've gotten so sinful and you've drifted so far away. And so he's he's just laying it down. And he even goes to the point of saying, you're evil from the top of your head to the tips of your toes. And he he compares them to Sodom and Gomorrah. He, he actually starts out with that in verse 10. And so just their total lack of understanding even of God at this point because their relationship with him has just gotten so awry. Um, we're going to see that they expected God to bless them and they're doing these mundane things and expecting God to bless them. So um, let's just go right into uh, verses 10 and 11 of chapter 1. It says, Hear the word of the Lord, ye rulers of Sodom, Give ear unto the law of our God, ye people of Gomorrah. To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices unto me, saith the Lord? I am full of the burnt offerings of the rams and the fat of fed beasts, and I delight not in the blood of the bullocks or of the rams or of the goats. If you think these are strong words, you just wait. It gets even stronger here in a few minutes. He's saying, for starters, he's saying, hear the word of the Lord. He says, I have the authority. I'm speaking for the Lord. I'm telling you what he's saying. And I have the authority to tell you that. And so you better hear it. And when he says hear, I don't think he's just saying, listen to me physically with your ears. I think he is saying, like when we say to our kids, did you hear what I just said? Are you listening to me? We're not asking them if their ears are working properly. We're asking them what their intention is. Are you going to mind me? Are you going to do what I said? Or are you going to ignore me? And I think that is exactly the connotation that um, Isaiah has here. And I, it literally says that that word, the Hebrew word that's used here, means, translates with the implication of obedience. And I think that's exactly how it says this. You better listen to me. You better hear this because this, this is a life or death situation. You better listen to me. And so he goes on to say, ye people, of, uh, you, uh, you rulers of Sodom and ye people of Gomorrah. He is comparing them to a people 
that literally were destroyed by fire from heaven. He's saying, you are that bad at this point. He, he's saying, you leaders, you have led your people down paths of evil, rebellion, and people, you have followed them willingly. And God is sick of it. God is sick of it, and you'd better listen to this. And so then he goes on, he says, to, to what purpose is your multitude of your sacrifices? What good are they? What good are your sacrifices? They're hypocrisy. We have no relationship, and you are sacrificing to me for nothing. You're sacrificing to me when you don't even like me. You don't even know me. We have no relationship, and yet you bring your sacrifices to the temple. I, I don't delight in them. I don't delight in them. I don't even like them, he's saying. You've rejected me. You have rebelled against me. And then you have the nerve to bring your sacrifices to the temple. Like we have a good relationship. That's like a husband abuses his wife and then brings her flowers. No, I don't think so. God is saying, we have no relationship. What good is your sacrifice to me? It's empty. It's useless. I thought of a, a time when we were in China. And we were on a tour bus and the little guide was talking about something. I think she, and she mentioned, I guess, that she was Buddhist or something. And so anyway, we were talking to her after that. And she said, oh, I am, but I don't really practice it. I send my money every month and I, I, these people, this other person prays for me. And that's exactly what this is. They're bringing these empty, meaningless sacrifices into the temple of God. She was paying someone else to say her prayers for her. Empty, useless. And so he's saying, what good are they? What purpose are they? What's the purpose of them? I don't delight in them. I don't even want them. And then we go to... Um, and, uh, well, before I do that, I, I wanted to say something. I thought, you know, we attend church. We give our offering. We don't do sacrifices, of course, but we give our offerings. We attend church. We sing some songs. We say some prayers. Do we just give lip service? Are we just giving lip service? Are we just going through the motions? If we are, then that's lying to God. That's just lying to God. We don't have the relationship. We're just going through the motions. If that's what we're doing, then we're no better off than they were, bringing those empty, meaningless sacrifices. And God said he was sick of it. He says, I'm full of your burnt offerings. I'm full of it. I'm sick of it. I've had it up to here. I don't want it anymore. I thought of a church service that we went to in Washington, D.C., and I've never been so uncomfortable in a church service in my life. Because I felt like it was a farce. It scared me. It literally scared me. And I think that's the kind of, of mundane, meaningless efforts that they were putting forth without any relationship. So let's read verses 12 through 14. If we thought that was strong language in those last verses, listen to this. It gets even stronger. When you come to appear before me, who hath required this at your hand to tread my courts? Bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. The new moons and the Sabbaths, the calling of assemblies, I cannot away with. It is iniquity, even the solemn meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts my soul hateth. They are a trouble unto me. I am weary to bear them. He says, when you come before me, who, who has required you to do these things? Well, that's kind of a rhetorical question because he had required them. He was the one that set up the sacrifices. He was the one who set up the, the, the feasts and the festivals and the meetings and all. He was the very one who established them and told them to do them back in Leviticus. But he's saying, don't do it anymore. 
don't do it anymore. The reason I set these things up, the reason I established these festivals and these feasts were to remind you, to remind you of our relationship, how much I love you and how much I want you to love me. Back in those first nine verses, he also talked about, I raised up my children and brought them forth. He, he brought them out of Egypt. He, he, he had created them in the first place and he, he brought them out of bondage, out of Egypt, and he had delivered them. He wanted them to remember. He wanted them to remember what he had done for them, how much he loved them, how he had, how he had saved them, how he had redeemed them. He wanted them to remember that. And that was the purpose of those festivals, the purpose of those feasts, the purpose of their meetings and their worship. But they had forgotten all of that. They had forgotten that. It just become empty worship. And listen to what he says. He says, bring no more vain oblations. Incense is an abomination unto me. You know, he, they burned incense, and he said it was a pleasing aroma to God's nostrils. And he said, it's, it's an abomination to me. And then he goes on to say, all your new moons and your festivals and your meetings and your feasts, I hate them. My soul hateth. They have gotten to the point that I literally hate them. I hate them. A while ago, he says, they make me sick. Now he's saying, I hate them. They are empty worship. I hate your empty worship. I hate what you're doing. It's a lie because we have no relationship. I'm weary to bear them. You're wearing me out. Have you ever told your kids, you are wearing me out? I think that's what God was saying. He says, you're wearing me out with this. Don't even do it. You, it trouble, you're troubling me. He says, up here it says, um, who, who even told you this to tread my courts? And that's, that's almost a, a, a reference to the, the ritualistic way that they had been doing. Treading, like, you know, on a treadmill, just over and over and over and over and over again. And he says, that's not the way I intended it. Don't just bring your sacrifices into me. The, the lesson, <clears throat> the lesson, I like the way that they, they talked about it. They said they were treating God like a vending machine. We bring our sacrifice in, you give us a blessing. We put our money in the vending machine, our money that we've worked hard and we've earned, so it's our sacrifice. We put it into the vending machine and we expect a product. And when we don't get our product, we're pretty upset with that vending machine. And it's like the people didn't want to have a relationship with God. They just wanted to bring their sacrifice and then, hey, give me this, God, and I need this. And by the way, we need this blessing. They were treating God like a vending machine. And Isaiah makes it very, very clear. He, I mean, this is a no bones about it. This is not what the offerings are for. The offerings are to show your love and appreciation to God. They're to show how sorry you are that you've sinned against God and that you recognize the cost of that sin. <clears throat> In verse 15, it says, And when you spread forth your hands, I will hide mine eyes from you. Yea, when you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. Again, I think they, the lesson talks about this being another reflection or, or uh, another reference to Sodom and Gomorrah because how were Sodom and Gomorrah acting? They were mistreating each other. They were horrible. They were murderers, liars, thieves. They were terrible, and they were terrible to each other. And so they said this is probably a reference back to Sodom and Gomorrah. Just remember when the angel... Angels went to Sodom and Gomorrah and they were staying with Lot and he offered to throw his daughter out to the men that were beating on the door because the men wanted to come in and rape the angels, rape the guys that were there staying with him. That's how horrible and, and demented they had gotten. And so he, they said it was probably a reference back to that. But what I thought of, and, and this is just Carolyn, this is not a reference, this is not even mentioned in the lesson. But what I thought of, because he's talking about these these sacrifices that you're bringing in 
They were bringing in just sacrifice after sacrifice. If you read about all the sacrifices, it was just hundreds and thousands, literally, of these animals that were being slaughtered. And so I thought to myself, you know, the sacrifice that they were to take in was a token for the forgiveness of sin, just a token of the sacrifice that was to come of Jesus Christ, the perfect sacrifice. And so they're bringing in these animals, in these meaningless sacrifices. They're just slaughtering animals for no reason. Animals are God's creation. He loves them. The, the pagan gods required the, the people who worshiped them to, to sacrifice their own children. And that was detestable to God. And so he required animal sacrifices to show the cost of sin. They weren't thinking about the cost of sin. They were just slaughtering animals. They weren't thinking a bit about the cost of sin. They were thinking about, this is, this is just my token to get God to bless me. This is our token to get God to bless our country. We need God's blessings so we take in and kill the animals. And they weren't doing anything but slaughtering animals. I thought of, I thought of baptism in the same way. I thought, you know, if you're not saved, if you haven't recognized your sin and been sorry for that sin and recognize the cost of that sin before you're baptized. That baptism is just a symbol. It's a symbol of that act of, of salvation and dying to sin and, and coming forth to live a new life in Christ, a life that honors God. And if that's not what you're doing with baptism, then you're just getting wet you may as well have gone swimming or taken a shower. You're just getting wet. And that's what they were doing with these sacrifices. They were just slaughtering animals for no reason. They weren't sorry for their sin. And so they had blood on their hands. And they were mistreating each other. But they had blood on their hands. God didn't want our money. He doesn't want our sacrifices. He wants our hearts. He wants our obedience. He wants our love. He wants us to reflect that love to our fellow man. That's what he really wants. And listen to these next two verses, 16 and 17. It's never too late. Wash you, make you clean. Put away the evil of your doings from before mine eyes. Cease to do evil. Learn to do well. Seek judgment. Relieve the oppressed. Judge the fatherless. Plead for the widows. Here he's saying, here's what you should be doing. Here's what I wish you were doing. Put these things away. Put away evil. Put it away. Just do the things you're supposed to do. Learn to do well. Learn to do good. Be kind and good to each other. Have a clean heart. Have a heart after me, after my will. That's what I want you to do. Cease to do evil. Take on this new behavior. That's what I'm asking you to do. And then he follows that with probably two, the two most familiar verses in Isaiah. When he says, Come now and let us reason together, saith the Lord. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If ye be willing and obedient, ye shall eat the good of the land. That's his desire. That's his desire. He says, come and let us reason together. Let's put an end to this madness. Let's put an end to this quarrel. Let's set it right. Let's get the relationship right so we can put an end to this. Let us reason together. And he says, your sins are like scarlet. They're red like crimson. They're, they're as bad as they can be. But I can fix that. 
I can fix that. I can make them white as snow. I can make them white as wool. I can fix that if. Here comes the if. If ye be willing and obedient. If you're just willing to come to me, get back in right relationship with me, put away those evil things, I will forgive your sin and I will make you right with me and I will bless you. I'm not blessing you because you bring me the sacrifices. I'm blessing you because I love you and I'm blessing our relationship. That's why I'm blessing you. Shane says all the time, he says there's no sin too big and there's no pile of sins too tall. And I think that is exactly what Isaiah is telling the people here. He says, it's been bad. It's been really bad. You're sinful. You're rebellious. You have, you have done God wrong. But look what he's offering you. He's offering to take this sin as bad as it is and forgive you and bring you back into right relationship with him. That's what he desires to do. You know, they had had warnings. Israel especially, the, the northern kingdom especially, had already lost territory to the Assyrians. They had already lost battles. They had tried to make deals and all this kind of stuff, and yet they didn't get the message. Isaiah is saying, get the message. Get the message and get back right with God. It's not too late. It's not too late. And then in verse 20, but we had the if over here in verse uh, 19. And now in verse 20, we have the but. But if ye refuse and rebel, ye shall be devoured with the sword. For the mouth of the Lord hath spoken it. Isaiah is saying, this is what the Lord says. And he will follow through. It's as good as done. He will follow through. You know, when E.F. Hutton speaks, you know, in the commercial, it just gets absolutely silent and everyone listens. When God speaks is when we better listen. And he speaks through his people. He speaks through his prophets. You know, everything we have read here, doesn't it just sound familiar? Doesn't it sound familiar? Empty worship. And I'm not saying that we have empty worship, but there is empty worship. There are people who go to church services and recite something and do something and turn around and walk out, and there was never an act of worship in it. We can do it in our own church service. We can sing a song, say a prayer, read a verse, listen to a sermon, and never enter into worship. That is exactly the same thing they were doing when they brought their useless sacrifices. God wants us to worship him. And a part of worship is obedience. Obedience. And so when God speaks, we have to listen. So if we refuse, we will be devoured just like Judah was going to be devoured, just like Israel was going to be devoured. We would be devoured we are no different. Do we just get lackadaisical? Do we, is it mundane? Is it habit? Is it ritual? Or do we have a heart that's humble? Do we have a heart that truly worships when we come before God? Do we have a heart that prays prayers that please God? Or are we just a asking for a vending machine? God do this, God do that, God do this. And that is a part of our prayer. Don't misunderstand. God says there's a, there's a storehouse that's full of blessings because we didn't ask for them. But do we have those parts of our prayer <clears throat> where we ask for forgiveness and where we honor and worship God in our prayer and thank Him, show Him how grateful our heart is? Or do we just say, God, give me this, give me this, give me this, and give me this? Are we any different than those people that Isaiah was warning, that Isaiah was calling to attention and says, 
hear this, hear this. If he's sick of our worship, sick of our sin, sick of our attitude, he won't hesitate to punish us just like he doesn't hesitate to punish them. We have a choice, and it's our choice. It is our choice. Each individual has a choice, and we corporately have a choice. As a church, as a nation, we have a choice. We can come before God willingly and obediently, and he will wash our sin as if it was never there. We will be as white as the purest snow because that's what God desires. He desires our relationship. He does not desire our empty worship. So when we worship, whether it's at home, privately, you know, worship isn't just at church. Worship isn't just going to church. Worship isn't just listening to a church service or a Sunday school lesson on YouTube. Worship comes from our heart, and it can be done anywhere, anytime. And it's that kind of relationship that God desires from us. So we need to inspect our worship, not to bring empty worship before God, not to bring it to his temple at his feet, like they were doing with these empty sacrifices that God hated. We want him to love our worship, to find joy in the attitude of our hearts. So let's please God. Let's hear Isaiah. Thanks.